Hey, welcome Journey Church family from my home, right to your home. I am still just blown away at the season that we are in, in that we are unable to gather. However, so thankful that I'm able to speak through this lens and go right into your home. And so I wanted to do a unique series over the next couple of weeks that I pray will be a blessing to you. So we decided to call this series Journey at Home. And the reason we wanted to do this series is simply because, well, we're all at home right now, and uh, I want this series to bless your home greatly. So my prayer is for this series uh, to encourage you in helping you develop the right culture right now in your home. So if I could put a title to the first message in this Journey at Home series, I would call it Miracles. Matter of fact, would you just say that with me right now? Everybody, one, two, three. Miracles. Amen. You know, I believe that God wants to bring miracles out of your home during this season. In fact, COVID-19 or no COVID-19, I believe that this is the place where miracles should be happening more than anywhere else. Come on, Journey Church. I've been saying this for 10 years. The New Testament church was never defined by a building, but it was defined by the people that fill those buildings. So no matter what building we're in, come on, God wants to move right there. And being that we live here, we should be experiencing miracles and his presence here more than we are anywhere else in our lives. I'm talking miracles in your home. Come on, what does Psalm 77 say? He says, you are the God who, come on, let's all say these next two words together, performs miracles. You display, the author of the psalm says, your power among your people. Somebody say miracles one more time. Amen. Now, miracles, as you know, come in a variety of different forms. Fun fact, at least it's a fact that's fun for me, did you know that across the entirety of the four Gospels, there are 35 recorded miracles having happened through the ministry of Jesus that were recorded. And of those 35, 17 of those miracles are bodily cures, healing from a disease or a sickness or someone's blinded eyes were opened or someone who was lame, unable to walk, was made to walk. Six of those miracles were people that were freed from demon possession. Three of those miracles were miracles of people who were raised from the dead leaving the 17 or sorry, or sorry leaving the nine remaining miracles that were recorded in the gospels were miracles that involved nature or miracles that involved natural elements like when he turned water into wine and of course these 35 miracles weren't all of the miracles that Jesus did John chapter 21 verse 35 says Jesus did many other things as well. He goes on to say, if every one of them were written down, I suppose he said that even the whole world would not have enough room for the books that would be written on the miracles that Jesus did. I want to look at one of those miracles today that involved nature and involved natural elements. And it's found in Matthew chapter 14. And it's the story, it's the account of Peter walking on the water. And there's some things in this story that I really believe will speak to the miracle that God wants to see come out of your home during this pandemic time. So if you got your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of Matthew chapter 14. I'm going to read out of the New International Version here this morning, and I want to read 12 verses of Scripture. So 
Hang in with me here. Pay attention. Let's put our attention caps on here as we dig in to a lengthy portion of scripture. Put your eyes right there at verse 22 of Matthew chapter 14. And it says this. It says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get in the boat and go on ahead of them to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. Now, let me stop there. The crowd that he's dismissing is the 5,000 that he just miraculously fed. It's right after that miracle takes place. And it says, after Jesus dismissed them, he, Jesus, went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, Jesus is still praying, says he's there alone. Meanwhile, it says, and the boat that the disciples were in was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves, because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. <laughs> I'm sorry, it just doesn't, doesn't never stop getting old. Walking on, come on, not in, on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. It's a what? Come on. What what did they say it was? It's a ghost, they said. They didn't even know who it was. And it says they cried out in fear. Mind you, there's a storm going on during this whole time in this scripture. And they see Jesus walking out to them and they, they don't even recognize him. I want you to catch that. The reason I want you to catch that is because I think a lot of us are learning to take a different look at who God is and what God looks like. In this time, in these stormy COVID-19 seas that we find ourselves on right now, that I believe we need to get to know. What I mean by that is I believe we're used to looking at Jesus in normal conditions, in normal circumstances, when everything's looking okay. But when everything is not, how many know God looks a little different? And we have trouble recognizing who God is and what he looks like to us. And it says this in the very next verse, but Jesus said, take courage. He says, he immediately said to them, take courage. It is I, do not be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. And what does Jesus do? Come on, he gives him the rock. Come on, come on. You want to do this? You smelling what I'm cooking? Come on, he said. And then it says, Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? When they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Mm. Man, I just want to go. I want to, I want to go on a side trail preaching tangent, but I can't. We got to move on. Then those who were in the boat, Bible says, had a straight up worship service and worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. What a story. Now, I don't know if you caught it when we read it, but there's a storm happening around this miracle again. Verse 24 says that this storm is so great that the winds and the waves are straight up attacking, buffeting. That's what the word buffet means. They are attacking the boat. And as I read the entirety of this scripture again and again, you not only see that this storm is happening, you not only see this one storm, but really there are three storms happening in these verses. Now, the first one is is easily recognizable, and it's much like the one that we're facing right now. The first one we see happening in this portion of Scripture is a physical storm happening. In their case, the storm was wind buffeting, again, attacking waves, and these winds and waves were more than likely combined with a lot of rain, lightning, and thunder. This was a real storm happening out on this lake. Hear me. The coronavirus, COVID-19, is a real storm happening 
right now. It's a real storm. And, and I know, have, have you seen the meme uh, that talks about how we need to take this time serious and uh, some people aren't honoring social distancing measures yet still? And, and somebody put a meme out that said, listen, here's why you need to take it serious. They said, when, when they said churches are closed, uh, as far as having services and, and public gatherings, casinos aren't letting anybody in. They said, if God and the devil are agreeing on something, you should probably take it pretty serious. I thought that was a pretty interesting meme. This is a very real storm. We have to be careful in what we allow this physical storm to do, especially in our homes. And what I mean by that is, we are all living in close quarters right now. Come on. We are all living on top of each other right now, straight up confined to our homes, spending more time with our families than we're used to spending with our families. Come on. Is there anybody out there finding it even to be just the slightest bit challenging, spending so much time with your families? Not that you don't love them, not that you aren't crazy about them, you do anything for them, but when you got to live with them 24-7, literally, come on, it gets a little child, just a little bit, right? You know, Missy and I are, are right now getting ready to move. We're actually getting ready to move across the family property that we are living on right now, and we're renovating and building on to a new home. By the way, isn't it just a perfect time, economically, to be taking loans out and doing that? Isn't it, just, isn't it just awesome? <laughs> you know, in, in all seriousness, before this even happened, we, we green-lighted this project, and we felt in January, we don't want to do anything while, without the Lord giving us a green light. We felt God give us a green light in January to begin doing this move and renovation. And we know if he said do it, in spite of what happens after it, we know that everything's going to be okay. You know, but one thing that I've learned in our relationship between Missy and I, already renovating this home that we're moving to is we are not Chip and Joanna Gaines. That's not us. When there's a disagreement over direction, we don't make cute little statements <laughs> that are good for TV and, and it's just cute. Like, no, we, we go straight werewolf on each other. Any, anybody go straight werewolf? On, on each other when there's a disagreement over direction. I mean, we're, hear me, we're not threatening divorce or anything yet. But, uh, you know, we, we want to say, like, for the other day, for example, Missy and I were, were talking about this task that we have to do, and, and it had to do with pulling up all the staples that were holding the lawn down uh, underneath the tiles that were on the floor, and she had an opinion on how it should be done, and I had an opinion. And in the midst of that difference in process, somewhere in the middle of it, we just kind of started going werewolf in conversation, and I found myself getting really short with her. Hear me, over, here, I, I, I pulled one out so that we can, we can have it. Over, over a staple. This is, we went werewolf over this. Over, over a staple, a staple. But how many know it, it really wasn't? the staple that caused the problem. It's really more the pressure that we feel in this physical storm that we're in with this virus. Because if I were to be honest with myself, the reason I was short really wasn't over a staple. It was, you know, stress that I'm experiencing as I'm trying to figure out how to navigate this church. I'm trying to figure out how to navigate the Dream Center and building beyond through this and I just have found myself at, at, at the staple time and and even time since coming up a little short with people my wife in that mixed and, and to me what what I'm saying to you right now exposes a real danger in that we can allow the physical storms we face to create other storms as well as as your pastor I'm concerned that this physical storm that we're in right now can turn into another kind of storm in your home that perhaps many of you are facing, and that's an emotional storm. Because that's the second storm we also see in the scripture in Matthew 14. Coronavirus is a real storm. 
But for some of us, this storm is turning into something much bigger than it needs to be. Maybe for you, it's turned into fear. Maybe for you, it's turned into excessive worry. Maybe for you, it's turned into loss of patience. Or, or, or maybe for you, it's turning into you just habitually treating or becoming short with your family members who are close to you. The real danger in allowing a physical storm to create an emotional storm is that it can then produce a spiritual storm. And that's the third storm that we see in this verse as well. And that's not the only place we see this type of thing happening. It reminds me of the storm in Mark chapter 4 that I preached on a few weeks ago where Jesus calmed that storm in the boat or from the boat. And, and before he did that, though, we see in Mark 4 that the disciples in the boat with Jesus are so filled with fear and worry that they run to Jesus in the middle of the storm, who, by the way, is sleeping in the middle of the storm. And they say to him in Mark 4, 38, Lord, don't you even care that we are about to die? Think about the nature of that statement. You see, when bad things happen, when storms blow in, sometimes those storms can create other storms. And we can allow spiritual storms to come from those things. And, and those spiritual storms we can allow to tell us that God has resigned from his care and his commitment to our lives. Now, back to these Matthew 14 waters that the disciples are on, and that Peter just walked on. We see that too with Peter. It amazes me that Peter thought, that he really thought he was going to die, drowning. When he cried out, Lord, save me, in verse 30, he thought this was it. This is my life's end. Stupid me. I ambitiously asked to come out of this boat and onto the water and do what he was doing Jesus called me to come out to him. I came, I walked on water for a moment, and now I'm going to straight up die in the middle of this storm on these open waters. It's amazing how Peter, in his mind, can be on the other end of this insane miracle that he was just part of. The guy just walked on water in the middle of a storm and now wholeheartedly believed that the Son of God, who is right next to him, by the way, is going to let him drown again. It's not that I don't think Peter freaked out that he necessarily dropped into the water. It's that he thought the Lord was just going to let him drown. Lord, save me again. We so often allow the storms we're facing to eliminate our trust in the care of God for our lives. I, I think sometimes storms reveal the depth of our relationship with God and the trust we really have for him when it, when it comes to times going south. I, I know it has for me personally. It has shown me the level of trust I have and the level of trust I need to have in God for him to bring me through this storm that we're in. Hear me. We will get through this. You will get through this. You have to trust that. And that is the miracle. <laughs> Hear me, Journey Church. That is the miracle I believe that needs to be experienced in your home right now. And it's this, the miracle of trust. When all this craziness and chaos is happening to the left of me and the right of me, I trust him none the less. Come on, maybe both your neighbors have lost their jobs. And maybe your neighbor across the street was just diagnosed with COVID-19. And maybe there's a lot of opportunity to freak out right now in your home. But hear me, you've got to hear me. Regardless of what's happening around you, you need to be a home that is anchored in trust. Trust that says somehow 
some way with God, every little thing is going to be all right. Come on, somebody. I, we, let's just go Bob Marley right now in this place. Right now, right here. Just put on the dreads and just sing it. Come on. Don't worry about a ting. Come on, sing it. Because every little ting, come on, is going to be up. Come on. You know what I'm saying? Trust should be the miracle in every journey, church, home. And you are one of those homes. And trust by nature is anchored hope. Come on, what does Hebrews 6, 19 say? We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Let me, let, me, let me read that again. We have this hope as a what? Anchor for the soul. Now let me ask you, why does your soul, which are your mind, your will, and your emotions, why does your soul need an anchor? Unless it's prone to wander off in the wrong direction sometimes. Hope in Jesus, according to this scripture, anchors your mind it anchors your willpower. And hear me, those of you who may be struggling right now. Hope in Jesus anchors your emotions. Come on, what does an anchor do? Y'all ready? Arts and crafts time. I made this right here. Come on, I, I made this. Come on, hey, nobody helped me. I took cardboard and I cut out a straight up anchor. Here's how I made it. I printed out the image I Googled, image searched, an anchor outline. I typed anchor outline in Google, clicked on images, <laughs> printed out the outline, taped it on a piece of cardboard, and cut it out. Anchor. Some of you are like, this looks like the logo for Prince. Listen. Or the artist formerly known. No, no, listen. This is an anchor. And I think it would be so cool if you did this. Not now, but after this message, over lunch or whatever, do this with your family, and then... Take a picture of yourself with it. Come on. Selfie family. Come on, journey at home. And then just put that on Facebook. You with an anchor. And put on that post, Hebrews 6, 19. And we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. I think it'd be awesome if we did that right there. People asking you, why you got a picture of your, your family with an anchor? And you just let them know how your family is anchored inside of this storm. That you're anchored to Jesus. But how, how does an anchor work? Here's how an anchor works. It has to grab onto something immovable, something permanent at the bedrock or the bottom of the ocean floor. While, while, and when it does that, while everything else is moving around it, come on, this thing does not. And once that anchor grabs onto it, it doesn't matter what's happening on the other side of this rope, what's on the other side of the anchor, if this thing's locked in, the thing that it's attached to is locked in as well. You're not going anywhere if you're anchored. Did you hear me? I said you're not moving if you're anchored. Somebody say a good amen to that right there at home. And I want to leave you today where, where you can, in the middle of this storm, record and experience miracles in the midst of this storm that's surrounding your home right now. And again, every miracle begins with the miracle of trust. Every miracle does. I want to give you quickly three ways to anchor your soul to Jesus. Number one, in other words, how do you, how do you anchor you to Jesus? Number one, you anchor when you worship. We anchor when we worship. Can I just say this? Singing brings spiritual success every single time. I, I got so many reports from people who love singing because he lives with us at the end of the service that we recorded for Easter Sunday. I love that song too. I don't know if you know the story behind that song. It was written by Bill and Gloria Gaither of the Gaithers, obviously. And it was the, the lyrics, however, were penned by Gloria Gaither, who was at the time in the late 60s expecting another child. But in the late 60s, they're in the middle of the Vietnam War and racial tensions are at an all-time high and the economy is starting to climb down to a, to a near record low. And to top it all off, her husband at the time, Bill, 
was experiencing the, the, the tremendous effects of an, of an infectious disease. And, and here she is pregnant and, and she's just struggling and stressing. And, and I don't know if I, I, how do I bring a child into this world that we're living in with all these things going wrong and just stress in the middle of that pregnancy. And it was in the midst of that stressful time that she climbed into a prayer closet and she pinned those lyrics that led to that famous chorus that says, you know what, here's how I know I'm going to get through it, because he lives. I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, she wrote, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, life is worth the living just because he lives. And that song has been an anchoring staple to our souls, to everyone who has sung it. Somehow, just the atmosphere of worship places a hope in you that anchors your soul to him and his care for your life, doesn't it? Somehow, just through singing to him, you get a confidence that everything is going to be all right. Because worship is a way that we can place our troubles in his hands. Isaiah 26.3 says, You will keep in perfect peace, O God, all who, come on, trust in you. All whose thoughts are fixed on you. So to help you do that, we want to encourage you to worship today. We want to encourage you to worship every day. And to help you worship we're making a soul-anchoring playlist for you on our YouTube channel. So take advantage of it if you can. Take time every day and worship and watch the worry melt. See the stress fade. Watch the doubt derail and experience the peace to come. We got to remember that peace isn't the absence of trouble. Peace is recognizing that God is with you in the middle of it all. And worship brings you to that recognition. Number two, we anchor when we remember. When we remember what? When we remember God's promise and God's past provisions in your life. Would you just begin to do that? Again, he didn't bring Peter that far out onto the water to let him drown. <laughs> and then after he drowns from the water, look at all the disciples and say, see, this is what you get when you doubt who's next, right? He didn't do that. No. When Jesus told Peter that he's going to make him a fisher of men, he meant it. And he wasn't going to allow anything to be big enough to devour that promise. So we must... Today, in the troubled waters of our present, remember that God did not bring you this far to let you drown now. So start recalling times and moments and start telling stories of what God has brought you through and what God has promised in and through your life. Come on, Psalm 119, verse 81. He says, my soul faints, but I have my hope anchored come on put into your word so hear me be careful where you put your hope be careful in how much news you consume right now what i mean by that is live balanced balance your life's input meaning what you allow into your life each day and what I mean by that is, why don't you try this? For every one minute you watch the news, that's one minute you need to spend with the Lord in prayer. That's one minute you need to spend in God's presence just worshiping him. Because if you're watching three to five hours of news every day and only spending three to five minutes in prayer with God every day, I guarantee you, you are freaking out on the inside right now. And I would bet this Hebrew 619 scripture is about as far from being lived out in your life as ever. Because if all you're doing is watching the news, that's anchoring your emotions to a moving entity. Come on, the news cycles are up and down by the minute. You can't put your hope in that. Our hope must be where? Come on, in his word and in the word he has given you for your life. 
Anchor yourself to that. Number three, and lastly, we anchor when we appreciate God's process in times like this. You know, sometimes God uses the storms we're in as the process for our progress. Sometimes he teaches us things inside of the storms that we find ourselves experiencing. And had Peter known that Jesus would end up teaching him something invaluable through this experience, had Peter known this moment on the water would be one of the greatest learning experiences he's ever had in his life before, had Peter known that he would come out of this storm ridiculously stronger than when he came into it, I believe he would have embraced the experience a lot different. And again, that embrace is accomplished through trust, through the miracle of trust. Trust him even when it hurts too. And we boast, Paul said in Romans 5, in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in our what? Sufferings, he said. When everything's not going our way, when life doesn't necessarily feel good. Why do we boast in those times? Paul said, because we know our suffering in God's hands, come on, produces perseverance. What does that perseverance produce? It produces character. And what does that character produce? Come on. Hope. Listen, if you're hearing me right now, you need to know you're going to get through this a lot easier if you would anchor yourself to saying, I'm going to be better after this than I was before. I think that that's something to put your anchor on today. Knowing that God uses suffering to strengthen me. That he uses the wine press to bring the best out of me. That he uses the storm for my success. In closing, I hope you hear my heart today because there may be some people watching me right now going, Pastor, I really don't like this message. <laughs> Come on, you're supposed to be making me feel good now. Hear me. Here's, here's, here's the miracle. Trust. And let God use this storm to bring the best out of your home. I heard a pastor, pastor say recently, trust doesn't build character, it reveals it. And if I'm being honest, this season, God has used it to reveal some things inside of my life that have been needing to go for quite some time. And I think he's preparing me for something greater. You know, since the beginning of the year, we talked a lot about revival coming to our church and through our church. Behold, I'm about to do something new, I said on January 5th, not having a clue just how new it was going to be. Remember that whiteboard? And we do. We believe God is going to bring revival to our church and through our church to the community and communities he's called us to live in and love. You believe that? Come on, that God's going to use our church? That God's going to use the church? You know, in every study I've ever done on church history and revival, God had to first prepare the church. God had to first prepare his people to receive what it was he was going to give him them. You know, God isn't just going to hand down something that will change and turn a community upside down for the glory of God to a church who's living complacent and comfortable. And I think we've been a little too complacent and comfortable as the church. And so maybe God is using this season to get us ready, to get a serious journey, church. Get ready for next week's message because I'm going to be preaching it from my bedroom and I'm not even going to tell you why I'm doing that until next week. But could it be that he's drawing us into our homes to get us closer to him than you've ever been before so that he can ready you for what he wants to do through you on the other side of the storm? Maybe now is not the time to think that this season is all about binging the next Netflix series. Come on, I know you love Tiger King. Hashtag Carol is guilty. I'm not telling you not to enjoy some time in front of the TV. 
But, but don't allow the wrong things to keep you from creating the right habits. Maybe now's the time for you to allow God more than anything to plow the hard ground in your heart. Maybe you've been too comfortable and growing too complacent in your Christianity. So if that's you, would you just right now pray with me? Would you just trust God with me and allow God to use this time to ready you and to ready me for what he wants to do through you and through me on the other side of this? Would you just close your eyes right now where you're at? And just ask God right now, God, would you use this time to bring the best out of me? Matter of fact, would you just say, God, I, I'm open to you using this time to bring the best out of me. God, I, I embrace trust today. I, I anchor myself into your word because trust in you has always been the birthplace of miracles. God, I, come on, right, right there in your home. Jesus, I trust you. Come on, I, I, th this is so important that you say this. It's so important right now that your kids say this. It's so important right now that your marriage says this. Come on, Jesus, I trust you in this pandemic. I trust you. And even if you have to use the pain of this season to strengthen me, and even if you have to use the time of this quarantine to do a deep work inside of me, I, I embrace it. My heart is open to it. I want to walk out of this better than when I walked in. And Father, I pray that blessing on every home, on every heart, in the name of Jesus Christ. May through this moment, miracles follow in every home watching, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Well, from my living room to yours, man, thank you for letting me share this word with you today. I encourage you to Join us next week from my bedroom. Uh, I had a lot of convincing to do with my wife to let me do this message next to the bedroom, but it's a good point. You're going to want to be part of it. But uh, right now, our virtual lobbies are opening up, and so we invite you to click on the link right now that's being shown on the comment feeds of whatever platform you're watching this on. And just, look, it doesn't matter if your hair is all done. Just go audio only. But just, just see somebody. See a face that's familiar to you and just ask them how they're doing. And just have a good time getting to see our church family again. We love you so much, Journey Church. God bless you. From my home to yours, we'll see you next week. Journey at home. Come on.